getting some user feedback, using tools like Hotjar, doing anonymous kind of UI testing, looking at all the analytics. And now about 50% of people who get to the start of our journey will actually complete a plan. So... Welcome to the Digital Customer Communications Podcast, where we discover how leading regulated companies engage, retain, and delight customers at scale. In this episode, we're joined by Kevin Hollister, founder of Guide, a platform simplifying retirement planning with digital tools. Hi, Kevin. Hi there. Kevin explains how to design intuitive, user-friendly, self-service tools to help consumers navigate complex topics. Kevin, a lot of our audience are, are working in financial providers or advisories or other regulated businesses. They may be thinking about deploying digital tools. How do you determine determine if there's a demand for a self-service digital tool? Yeah, I suppose I can only talk about our own experience. And uh, it's probably it's probably quite useful because when we built Guide, we, we had no idea if there would be any kind of demand for the type of tools that we were, the tool that we were effectively putting on the market. So the first, I, I suppose, the first hurdle for us was to determine whether, you know, people were actually kind of looking for the kind of help that we would provide them with. So we had a we had an inkling that if people weren't going to get advice and they would be dealing with what is possibly one of the you know the hardest financial problems that there is uh, in providing an income um, throughout retirement but we didn't know if that was something that they would be seeking help on in some way if they weren't going to get advice now there were lots of really good advisor tools voyant cash calc to, to, to name a couple but they were tools that by kind of definition you was already getting advice because the advisor was using them in conjunction with the advice process so to have, we were aiming for a tool along those lines a bit more simplified that people could use on their own and we quickly found out that there was a demand for this. And the way that we did it really was to look at Google and the kind of search terms and how many people were searching for this kind of a tool or help or assistance or the kind of terms that would lead them to that type of tool, um, you know, via, via a search engine. So that's how we kind of looked at it, first of all. And we could quickly establish that, I think it was over 100,000 people a month were searching wow. for, searching for essentially help in how do I, you know, convert my pot alongside, every, my pension pot alongside everything else I've got into an income that's going to last me for, you know, last me for life. So it became quickly sort of apparent to us that that was the case. And we never used any terms like advice, providers, guidance, all of those kind of terms, which would be kind of quite commonplace. We use much more sort of generic terms along the lines of, I need a pension calculator. You know, how much money do I need at retirement? Um, all of those type of things, which people would just type in rather than I'm looking for advice or I'm looking for a certain provider. Yeah, I mean, that's that's our own experience of, of how we determined. Oh, there does seem to be a really kind of large market here looking looking for this kind of help. So, so once you've identified that there's a market, you then set about building a tool to to meet that demand. Were there any challenges that you experienced along the way? Well, it was a little bit the other way around. We um, kind of took a punt to some degree and sort of thought, well, if advice isn't made compulsory, we believe that people will need this kind of help. Yeah, and we we kind of built the tool first and then you can obviously kind of really sort of test the tool and how how easy it is to attract people to it once there's something you know you kind of v1 version if you like yeah uh, that's there to see if people are actively looking for it and if they would come to your site in the first place so so that's how we went about it we we, we kind of built it first i still had a full-time job at the time then went kind of part-time and then once it was that mvp or that v1 version was ready we then kind of launched it to uh, yeah just to determine how much of that audience we could you know potentially get to our site and what the costs involved were doing so so i imagine if you've got such a big market to target with a tool like this you're actually able to to identify 
the the pitfalls the challenges within the the journey the customer journey quite easily because you've got quite a lot of traffic going through it so you must have refined it quite a lot over time from that v1 version that mvp as you say what what kind of changes have you made over time and can you share any sort of best practices yeah sure so i mean essentially goal one was you know is that market there and can we attract them to the site reasonably cheaply i suppose because we had no other way of attracting people to the site um initially so we, we answered that question quite quickly and you've got very quickly we had about ten thousand people coming to the site each month or new users coming to the site each month and it wasn't costed as much to attract those people and like you say that that then provides the perfect user base to actually you know refine the site and make it much more user-friendly. So the tools and the site themselves are absolutely useless if people can't use them on their own. So, so, so goal one was getting people there, but then goal two was obviously getting people to complete the journey and actually get some value out of what we were providing to them. And uh, we quickly established that because I'm an actuary by background, I had made it things way too complicated for people. And I think, you know, in that initial period when we first launched, we had something like about a one to two completion rate from people who started to people who finished. And uh, it became evident to me really quickly that I had to really, really simplify things down in order to uh, to, to make that flow through the journey uh, much better. So then we spent literally about a year getting some user feedback, using tools like Hotjar so we could video people and we could see how they interacted, doing anonymous kind of UI testing, looking at all the analytics. Where did people drop out? What were the problems they had in answering certain questions? What were they really confused by? And we did about a year, as I say, of that kind of research. And then by keeping all of the calculation, if you like, in the background, but making the front end as easy as possible, we ended up you know, changing that completion rate from about one to two percent to around 40 to 50 percent quite quickly. So about and now about 50 percent of people who get to the start of our journey, which is called the U page, um, will actually complete a plan. So, yeah, it's a seven page journey. It takes about five minutes at least to do. So that's pretty good kind of completion rate for 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 that type of journey. And to be honest, we had a bit of luck involved as well. One of the uh, one of the main issues was if you ask somebody what they think they need in retirement it is really quite difficult um, for people to um, to understand that and to um, to give you a figure you can ask them lots of questions and then give them an answer um, but again that you know that causes people to drop out they don't want to ask a lot of questions answer a lot of questions etc and we were we were fortunate that the plsa they came out with their living standards and that really helped in terms of giving people a anchor, if you like, in terms of, well, this is a reasonable living standard of what you need in retirement for a minimum income, moderate, comfortable income. And they could see that number uh, and then they could say, OK, well, you know, I might want 30 percent more than the minimum or I'd be happy if I took. 10% less than the moderate or, or so forth. So with, with by answering two questions, do you live in London and, and, uh, and uh, what type of income are you aiming for? You know, you could give people a really good grounding and that really, really helped, I think, and just in terms of, yeah, if you say to somebody, how much do you think you need? It could be anything. If you give them a grounding, it's much, much easier for them to, uh, you know, to kind of self-serve on that particular answer and, yeah. and you know, look for a target income themselves, which isn't unreasonable. Yeah. People don't want to think too much about these questions, do they? You do often find that if you're given a suggestion, at least, or an example, that kind of jogs your your memory or, you know, just gives you some kind of direction, some, like you say, navigational anchor to, yes. to go by. As you say, that kind of anchor in terms of give people a suggestion and then they can they can change that suggestion but at least they've started off with a reasonable suggestion we do that around what kind of target income they want and we do that around um, growth assumptions so again you ask somebody what return they expect to get on their pensions and their savings pots it's quite difficult to answer but if you say a reasonable return maybe around after charges maybe around five percent for a medium risk type portfolio that gives people an anchor and then if they change from 
from that kind of 5% up to say 7% or so, you can say, well, okay, that's fine, but you're now moving into a kind of more higher risk scenario that you won't get those returns or you've got to, you know, use higher risk investments in order to achieve them. Yeah. Uh, so that anchoring worked really well. And the other thing that we noticed really quickly was that you know, people set a target income and they set tell us everything they have and then we effectively do the maths to work it all out for them and lots of times you'll see shortfall bars in terms of they're not going to be able to get that income and the shape of that income that they want over their retirement period and we used to have lots of different ways that you could play with that you know you could um, you could take a little bit less you could retire a bit later you could do this you could do that and you'd have all these different kind of variables you could do and we quickly found out people just didn't want that they just wanted the answer so right. we have we have three solve buttons now and our solve buttons are take a little bit less pay in a bit more in way of contributions or look to you know look to use another asset if you can so you know for lots of people coming into retirement and i think this is going to be you know something which becomes a feature more over the over the coming years is there are lots of people in that kind of 40 plus kind of cohort 50 plus kind of cohort who may not have that much in the way of retirement savings but probably have an awful lot of equity in their home and you know they could release that equity either through downsizing or equity release and so forth and you know i think that's going to be a reality for a lot of people you know if you've if you've got a relatively moderate pension pot and not not a lot else you've got that the state pension you're probably going to have to access some of that equity from your home in some way like i say either through downsizing or equity release or so forth so so we have those kind of free solves and we give people the answer if you reduce your income by 20 percent, it'll work or it should work you know be expected to work if you pay 500 pound a month more in contributions up until you retire it'll work if you can get eighty thousand pounds in equity or you know via another asset through downsizing or so forth then you know that 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 would be something which would solve your plan as well and uh yeah giving people the answers rather than variables to play around with we thought we found worked really really well with people so has it helped that you're obviously dealing with retirement so you would assume that there'd be a, a certain demographic of audience coming to you to use this tool is that is that the case or would that be an assumption yeah so it's it's strange because when we when i first built guide i thought it would appeal to people with kind of sub hundred thousand pound pots you know I, I suppose people with less in the way of pension assets you know and looking to you know use that draw that down on top of their state pension and so forth but what we actually found was that the demographic who come through guide the people who register and save their plans with us they've probably got pension pot assets on average of around 300k uh, and they might have about 50k in other savings like ices and so forth as well so yeah. it's actually probably kind of more that kind of mid-range of, of people where they they do have enough to have a more than viable long-term sort of drawdown plan but they're probably not in that although some are but they're probably not in that kind of half a million type plus bracket which, which you typically see going to, to advice and or going to advisors and getting advice in, in in one form or another so certainly the demographic that uses guide is probably more wealthy than I and how I had initially envisaged and that works really well on our consumer side and we have various different types of versions that we license out to to other entities and they may be similar demographics or they may be um, demographics of people with um, you know a lot lower in in form of savings and effectively to to try and get the same kind of completion rate with those we we kind of tweak our defaults a bit so for example if you're dealing with people with who've probably got less in the way of pension pots you probably want to set the initial tax-free cash to zero so they've got uh, you know enough or they've got more to provide an income and you probably want to set the initial default of of how much they want from moderate to 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 minimum and in that way you know, they target the, those amounts. They don't see a sea of red, of just, you know, when they come into the area, which effectively gives them the answers, and which can obviously put a lot of people off if you see, oh, I'm going to run out of money in five to ten years, you know, between five to ten years, I'm just seeing all these sea of red bars. So we, we kind of tweak, we tweak things like that, but we're also kind of realising that there are, we think guidance works really well, but you've got to kind of target the guidance that you give to the particular situation that somebody's going to do. So if you're somebody who's got a £20,000 pension pot and you're considering taking all your money 
as cash, uh, which a lot of people do. You know, they'll just cash in their whole pension pot if it's a reasonably small amount. When people do that, they're not really looking for a long-term planning tool. They What they need to know is, is that £20,000 going to cause me some financial... If it, if it is taking that all as cash, going to cause me some financial harm in some way. So am I going to overpay some tax if I'm you know eligible for some benefits? And is that going to affect the benefits that I could get? And then finally, if I take that, and you know, I don't have um, other pots elsewhere or other final salary schemes or you know, home equity or so forth. You know, effectively, what, what we're going to live on for the rest of my ta- my retirement if I you know take that. So we have a kind of a, a separate a, a sort of se- separate journey now where you can look at somebody's initial choice and you can give them guidance which is much more relevant to them in terms of are you going to cause yourself financial harm and okay let's see if you can at least achieve the minimum income from state pension age when your state pension will kick in as well so yeah so there's been a lot of kind of refining and tailoring for different kind of audiences so the the version that exists on your website is Mm -hmm. actually quite a lot broader than then you could make the tool when licensed for specific applications for specific demographics. How did you settle on on that version as the the version that would be most applicable to to the broadest audience? So in terms of you know seven pages, how do you decide that something's going to be seven pages long? How do you balance like detail versus clarity? Yeah, I mean, I suppose in the st- I mean, <laughs> being an actuary again, always like to do things step by step. So to me. It- kind of made sense the seven steps we have is like you where we find out a bit about the person like basic information date of birth when they want to retire so forth and and then you know what they want so tax-free cash income the shape of the income that they want because lots of people probably spend less in their later years in real terms and they you know when they're 80 two compared to when they're 72 you know they just be less active and so forth then what have they got so everything comes in 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 that particular page and then the next pages are really about giving people answers so if everything goes to plan will your plan work and then we we kind of say well we know that things won't go to plan or <laughs> they won't go exactly as expected so what if this happens you know what if you get slightly lower returns what if there's a market crash just after you retire what if you live a bit longer and what if you need some care all those type of things that people can relate to quite easily and then effectively on the last page we give people the full kind of answer you know this is how you would take your pots down and, and, and so forth so yeah so that step-by-step approach was something that we that was our initial view of this might work quite well and then we tested it and it seemed to kind of yeah it kind of seemed seemed to work quite well on that kind of consumer base and then you know when we've licensed it or uh, customized it for different use cases it really depends on the use case that the licensee you know wants to do it for well one thing that i do find quite curious though is a couple you know sometimes when we're looking at the long-term sort of drawdown tool so guide as it is as a consumer side have had some pushback from people who've said i think this is too complicated um you know for our users if they are going into drawdown and so forth and i have a kind of fairly sort of simple answer to that and that is that you're you're going if you go into drawdown long-term drawdown you're going to have to manage your income for the next 30 years you know how much you can take um, each year without running out of money and so forth and you've got to manage your investments etc unless you get advice now my view is that if you can't use a tool like guide or other tools you know that are similar unaided then execution only drawdown isn't you know that that shouldn't be something that you're doing you should be seeking advice so that somebody can help you manage this year by year or you should be buying a guaranteed income where you've only got a you know basically think at one point in time of what's the best annuity rate i could get so yeah i i i, I do find that it's quite curious that people would say oh it's a bit too complex but you know if it is too complex for somebody they shouldn't be going into you know what could be 25 to 30 years of managing their own finances and in retirement without you know without some form of advice or you know perhaps a better route for them is to buy a guaranteed income and that's part of building a tool like this is building it for an audience isn't it yeah. you know that you're building it for an audience that have a certain level of financial literacy and because it's going to enable them to do something that if they don't then they're really going to struggle what would you say to sort of financial providers advisories 
firms that are looking to build tools like this that are similar. You've obviously gone on this journey. Is it an easy one for them to go on themselves, for them to build internal tools, or should they be licensing them in? I suppose I have a bit of a conflict of interest there in saying that they should, uh, yeah, probably be licensing tools uh, from the from the likes of us. But I mean, I, I suppose it depends on the different kind of uh, you know the, the different kind of user. So if you're an advice firm, you are probably going to sit down and you know you're going to use like a cash cow or a boy and, and you're going to deliver that advice and you're going to even put everything into that and you're going to advise your client based on you know what you've sat down with and uh, you know the plans that you've built in those kind of particular tools that is absolutely fantastic for everybody who you know kind of takes advice one of the things that we have found is that some advisors now that are licensing guide like the fact that it's not something which is almost behind the curtain in that I'm the advisor, I go off and I produce this for you. You can sit down with the individual and, you know, you can almost do it together. So you can gauge their level of understanding where you're going through this, whereas, you know, some of those other more technical kind of calculators somebody is really going to struggle to be able to do that and effectively the advisor is always going to kind of do that for them so so that's you know that that's a route where i think is if, if you're looking to develop your own tools my own view would be uh, you know something that you can engage with the individual and you're both kind of working through it together or they're even having a first go at it and then you're discussing it with them and so forth rather than a you know behind like I say, behind the curtain, we've done all of these calculations. Here's your kind of lovely cash flow plan and and, uh, and report type thing. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it really kind of depends on, on those that advisor's kind of philosophy of you know which route they would like to go down in terms of involving the client or not not involving the client with providers and so forth. It's obviously a lot different because somebody's not going to you know to be there to hold their hand, go through it with them and so forth. So it does have to be like I said, coming back to my previous point, it has to be at a level that the person can use it on their own, but. I do think there does need to be some degree of it, it's almost like a hurdle that there is some degree of competency in being able to 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 use any, any tool that's provided because then you do know well yes this individual is going to be capable enough of managing their own retirement over you know over a number of years um I suppose if it was yeah if it if it was if it was too easy and it was too simplistic well one it probably wouldn't be that good for a lot of practical use but two i think you maybe be lulling people into a bit of a full sense of security in terms of well there is actually a lot to kind of think of here over a long period of time and a lot could you know could go wrong and you you know you need to kind of keep track of that and so forth once a tool like this is deployed so say you're a financial provider and you deploy a calculator which many of them have what would be your advice for getting that tool used by customers would it just be for, to build it for a specific audience and then testing 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 or what other other advice would you give well I, I suppose the key point is that it's not a static tool so you know so people come into if I, if I talk about our own experience people will come into um, guide and they will build a plan but from that point on they don't need to go into the main journey they can go to a dashboard and they can uh, effectively just uh, update the flexible parts so they can update their pension pot or it could even be live updated if it's connected to their pension pots they can update their uh, savings pots and so forth so effectively you're giving them like not a not a, a kind of static tool but you're effectively giving them something which sort of holds their hand over a long sort of period of time so you can then see how many people are re-engaging back in with it and so forth i mean the ideal scenario is obviously that people kind of come back in and check in say like once a quarter and just say all right okay yeah everything still looks on plan it looks like you know i can continue to withdraw my money at the you know the rate that i wish to do and you know my long-term plan looks 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 kind of viable so I mean, I suppose if you think about it from the user's point of view, what do they really want to know? They want to know, obviously, the value of their flexible parts, their savings, pension pots, and so forth. If they're already in decumulation, they want to know, well, what's my payment that I'm going to get next month or for the next few months or so forth? And then the thing that they really want to know is, you know, is my plan still viable? So, you know, if the markets have gone down a bit, if tax rates have changed, if, you know, what's been rumoured about potential pension changes in the budget and so forth, you know, they're updated all automatically in the background person here is a oh you know i don't know making out but you know 
tax on pensions has now changed quite dramatically. They can go in there and see, you know, have I still got a long term kind of viable plan for the after tax income that I want or mm-hmm. the market's really down? Do you know, does, does my plan still look, look on track? So we obviously use a lot of analytics and so forth to see. Yeah, how many people come through the journey, but then how many people kind of re-log in, check their dashboard, etc. And uh, I think having that kind of, rather than kind of one-off static tool, but having that kind of dynamic process in that things are going to change over time, let's keep tracking it, let's see if you're still on course, is obviously a good way to really engage people. And these might be people who they've never spoken to you before, they've just arrived at the site, found the tool useful, and they keep coming back to it. So I guess there's two kind of, cohorts if you're a business looking at deploying this kind of tool there's your your customers and it's also a top of funnel acquisition strategy as well a marketing tool if you like to put on your website for people to get engaged with your brand and and learn about their their finances and then maybe further engage with you in a kind of hybrid style yeah yeah so i mean again completely depending on so we we have some um, we have some licenses that use it for that basis so i mean if you take a couple of examples yes if you're a provider and you're providing some you know some really good tools to say this is how we can help you uh, you know you might be a few years from retirement but we can show you can plan up to retirement and then taking your money as well and we can kind of do that on an ongoing basis and so forth then it's not difficult for for that potential provider to market that out and yeah you know initially get people registering and so forth and then you can remarket to them the benefits of your product and so forth for for decumulation um, in a similar way with an advisor as well if you if you put those tools out there and people use them there'll be people who are perfectly comfortable to use them on their own but there'll be other people who say, right, okay, well, I realise this can't give me investment advice, for example. You know, it's, it would be good to speak to an advisor of to see, well, how exactly do I, you know, do I achieve that 5% after charges return that I need I mean, in order to make my plan work? So there are various different ways it can be used as a, a, a marketing tool like that. And one, But one of the other routes that we found really interesting was that um, we had a master trust that was, that was using it and they would provide it to all of their members and one of the key benefits, I suppose, from a from a commercial point of view, is that you may know that somebody has ten thousand pension pot with you, but you've got no idea what they may have elsewhere. They may have two hundred thousand pound in pension pots from previous works elsewhere. And one of the I suppose the side benefits of guide is that it doesn't work unless people put in all the different pension pots that they've got. So you can, as a provider, you can you can you can see. Okay, so I know that my members who've used these tools have got X amount of money in pots elsewhere. And then if you make it really kind of easy for them to do so and you've got a good product yourself, it's not difficult to say to people, well, why don't you bring those bring those pots in, you know, pots in with us and put it all in one place. And what was really surprising when we did that was that we found that 50% of the pots that got put on the platform for kind of modeling purposes and so forth ended up being transferred in to, to that provider. And uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting as well because pots got put on there from different providers and you could see a real range of those that transferred from other providers to those who were quite happy to put their pots on there to use it as a market, uh, sorry, as a modeling tool, but didn't want to transfer their pots over, which is probably, and you would say the ones where there was a low percentage of transfers across, you would probably say, well, they're obviously doing something really good because their customers are kind of keen to keen to stay with them. What's the uh, future for Guide and where can we find you? Uh, yeah, so you can find us at guide with two eyes dot co dot uk and the future for us at the moment is we've now got quite a large amount of registered users who've built and safe plan with us regularly kind of come back in and check on their plans and so forth and we want to make the implementation of those plans as easy as possible for for people so if so for example i mean a really high level if somebody's got a cash flow plan that they have built which is expected to work if we can provide that cash flow plan to a provider and the provider just pays it for them until they tell them otherwise like an annual review and so forth then that makes life a lot simpler but as well with with investment managers if you know how somebody expects to take their plan the default investment strategy that you can give them 
can be much more tailored to that plan because you know you, you know if that person's likely to be heavily withdrawing in the first few years or if they're lightly withdrawing and you know want to pass them or want to pass their pot onto their spouse and so forth there's just there's a lot there's a lot more you can do around defaults if you know how the individual intends to to take their money whereas a lot of kind of default lifestyle funds etc almost kind of second guess what the person may do and it could be the wrong guess and it can be really really quite bad for the for the individual we saw recently when interest rates rose and so forth you know a lot of the value of the pots came down in retirement so more personalization more customization and and more refinement yeah yeah more guidance but more customized or personalized type guidance rather than overall default to suit to try and suit everybody but may not suit lots of different people sounds amazing well we'll definitely be keeping tabs on you thank you for joining me today thank you very much for having me on